My next guest is Brandon Beliso. Brandon is the author of Live, Learn, and Grow and a contributor to the internationally bestseller Black Belt Power. He's a TEDx talk speaker and has traveled the world presenting workshops and speaking at Facebook, Stanford Healthcare, Lululemon, Microsoft, Barclays Global, UCSF, SF County Correctional Department, and many more. Brandon, known as Professor, is an A3 black belt and the owner of One Martial Arts in San Francisco in Millbrae. His reputation spans 50 years as a student, instructor, competitor, and innovator of award-winning life skills, kickboxing, and martial arts programs. Brandon practices Kenpo Karate and is also trained in Kung Fu, Jitsu, Arnis, Boxing, and Kickboxing. He's competed in and won over 100 major competitions. Brandon was a recording off artist in the Philippines with three top 10 hits. He has been featured on Evening Magazine, CBS Morning News, KRON for Health, Dojo, Asian Times, and Martial Arts Success Magazine. Brandon is committed to life, to, to committed to being a student for life as a dedicated father, husband, and servant to the community. Welcome to the podcast, Brandon. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me, Dana. Well, tell me about a time when you were in the trenches and managed to pull out. You know, I think in many ways, uh, we're always in the trenches. I mean, I can pick so many stories from the day I was born at 11 months going into a foster home to my parents getting us back at the age of five and Mm -hmm. my father being physically abusive to my mom and us being molested at eight, being molested at 12, growing up on welfare and food stamps, uh, being bankrupt at 25, um, being in the delivery room at 16, having a son. I mean, I think we are always in the trenches to some degree. Mm-hmm. And the art of it is to embrace that as much as we do the joys and the triumphs and recognizing that suffering is as equally as valuable as our victories and our triumphs in life. Yeah. So yeah. I, I think I'm constantly in the trenches, it feels like sometimes. Yeah, and you've definitely taken all those uh, stories of your growing up to you're working with kids and um, helping them learn martial arts and being involved in the community, correct? Yeah, very much so. You know, again, growing up in an environment where there weren't a lot of resources, money was short. We learned to fend for ourselves back then. Many of the systems, you know, Medicare, things like that were very challenging. So we simply didn't go to the dentist. I can remember the first time I went to the dentist, I had like 11 cavities and some of the cavities were so bad that my molars had more cavity than tooth. And the doctor was so mad at my father because it was obvious Mm -hmm. neglect, right? On my father's Mm -hmm. part. And, you know, it's moments like that, that really you, you take two positions. One, you either live from a victim mindset poor me, poor me. I'm this way because of this happening to me. I'm this way. And and I understand that because being a child, I was a victim. I didn't ask to be molested. I didn't ask to be physically abused. I didn't ask to be in a foster home. But as a full-grown adult, as a full-grown adult, I think I have the the opportunity to learn from that and either choose to become a better person or allow that vicious cycle, Dana, to repeat again and again and again, making the same mistakes over and over, expecting different results and conveniently blaming it on, that's because the way I was brought up. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think that's the way, you know, if people want to be successful, you know, it's it's it, making themselves better despite the circumstances. Um, so let's talk a little bit about different things that you are uh, doing right now. So you have the Success Never Sleeps podcast. Uh, talk to me a little bit about the target audience for that podcast and um, some of the feedback you've gotten on it since it started. Yeah, Success Never Sleeps has been around for about six, seven years now. Mm-hmm. And it started out where when I just had one location and about 500 students, now we're at two with close to a thousand. And I would drive home at the end of the night and Facebook Live was there. And I started doing these car talks is pretty much what they were. And I'd sit there and just share with other martial arts school owners, hey, this is what I learned today. I did this technique, or I spoke to this parent this way and got this result. And I was cultivating this innovative content because Mm -hmm. I believe in service. And much of the martial arts industry is driven by contracts and phone scripts and upgrades and belt testing fees. And that never resonated Mm -hmm. with me at a value level. So success never sleeps was born out of that. 
So in our industry, I'm noted as a giver. Brennan likes to give because I believe in giving. I think that's one of the highest forms of being human and it's something we should do freely and passionately. So it was born out of that. And then it, it became success never sleeps because most of the time I'd be in my car at 1030 at night coming home from the school after mm-hmm. working. And so that's pretty much where it came from. The demographic nowadays covers everything from a small business owner to an entrepreneur to a martial arts school owner and a lot of personal development. Because being a small business owner, your personal self affects the business tremendously, mm-hmm. tremendously. So I think it's very important that we keep ourselves healthy physically, emotionally, spiritually, mentally, uh, and, and we have systems and balances in place. People say that, you know, you always seem so balanced. And at 60 years old, you know, I just turned 60 in January. Absolutely. I get a certain amount of sleep. I meditate. I journal. I read. Right? It's very important for me to create that balance in my life. Because ultimately, I think success is being happy. And if you listen to my TED Talk, Happy on Purpose, my purpose in life is to be happy. And we know that. We can see data every day, Dana, that shows us people with a lot of money and influence and notoriety aren't always the happiest people. So Mm -hmm. if we truly believe materialism is what's going to make us happy, then we're always going to be challenged because it's a bottomless pit, right? Mm -hmm. You never have it. You need a bigger house, a bigger car, you know, on and on. If we learn to be grateful for what we have, then I think that's a great starting point. I mean, anything above poverty, I'm a happy guy because I grew up on welfare and food stamps. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, so, mm-hmm. But I think people mistake in that um, because I am a very smart business person and I do manage money well and I know how to create wealth. So people mistake in that. You know, they think I'm a kumbaya tree hug in California guy. And I think that's the yin to the yang. That's mm-hmm. really important. But I, I often have to pre-frame that because people mistake in that. Yeah, you've seen both sides of the coin. And yeah, it's like learning how to manage on very little and realizing that it's it's the the health that counts. It's not the material possessions. Like like you noted, there's so many people out there. And I think as the people get more and more um, you know, swept away the younger people with the, you know, everything that's on social media, right? They think mm-hmm. about, oh, the material possessions this person they follow has, right? But like you said, being healthy. Uh, living a good life, uh, be at one with yourself um, at age 60 and, you know, continuing to, you know, just age healthy, right? Mm-hmm. That's um, definitely um, spreading wisdom. So you have a lot of uh, things that people can tune into. So I, I would like first to talk about the live event. You have one coming up um, August 13th through 16th. I do. Talk to me a little bit about that. Well, it's, the series is called It's Time Live. And I, there's a small backstory there, if I can share that. I was talking to a school owner in England, and the time difference made it two in the morning here. And his wife was six months pregnant. He had just went full time with, with his martial arts business. He was all freaked out. So I'm trying to help this guy and talk to him about strategies to grow a school and generate revenue. And when, when I got off the phone, my wife looked at me and said, she woke up, she goes, what are you doing? I said, babe, I'm talking to this poor guy in England and I'm trying to help him. She goes, you know, it's time. I go, what do you mean? It's 2 a.m. You know, it's time you start charging people for this stuff. Because <laughs> I would. I, I, but see, but I gave it away freely because I was trying to hone my craft. Mm-hmm. I wanted to make sure that the data I was offering was relevant and of value. And as I had more case studies, then I recognized, yeah, this has legs and it's worth offering to people. So It's mm-hmm. Time Live, August 13th through 16th, is a four day experience, is really what people come all over the world for, because in it, we do work on their brand. We work on their culture, their core values, their purpose statement, system, staff training, all of that. But it's really that experience of personal development. Mm -hmm. So we do silent meditations. We do a lot of work outdoors. uh, And it really is about you uniting the personal self with the business or your goal self, because you just do so much better. You know, this, it's not personal, it's business. I think that's way passe. You know, everybody today, I was just at Meta. I I taught a workshop on leadership. I did a team event the other day at Meta. And to sit with people that are early adopters and forward thinkers, and they're just so much open to wanting to be a better person while fulfilling the purpose, you know, Facebook, which is Meta now. And it's just, it's very cool. And I think when we can unite our purpose 
you know, with our passion and create a business with it, we can really affect change in the world and impact it and do great things. So that's the event. And, and it's pretty cool. I've done it for about six years now. Mm-hmm. And it is very intimate, 20 people, four days. Okay. Um, we do a two-day event and a one-day event, but it's always the four-day event. Anytime I can facilitate something and learn a lot and become a better person, that's when I know I'm doing good work. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Now, is this open for a certain period of time or do people need to sign up early? Well, they should sign up. There's only eight spots left out of the 20. Absolutely. And if you are a small business owner, potential entrepreneur or, you know, people come to me to discover that they no longer want want to work a nine to five and they're in that exploration stage. And sometimes they'll spend four days with me and go, nope, I have no desire to be a small business owner (laughs) because there's a lot of moving parts. And to be successful, you have to wear a lot of hats. You simply do, Dana. I mean, you do. And every day you are in the trenches constantly, you know, especially through this pandemic, we witnessed that. And I know in my business, we've been in the trenches for two and a half years. And Gratefully, both of our businesses are still thriving and standing, and it took a lot of pivoting and adapting and dealing with the uncertainty and the fear and the unknown. And that type of leadership is not something that you're born with. I mean, we learned through this pandemic to be a more, I learned to be a more empathetic leader, and I learned to value my team even more um, and to communicate in different environments, virtual, like right now, here we are, virtually. And it's really, how can I connect with you emotionally? How can I be able to fulfill my purpose, whether it's virtually, on the mat, um, in a parking lot, or wherever I'm allowed to do that? Um, it's, it's really the joy of life to be able to fulfill that. So, uh, kind of in that same vein with um, an experience, you also do one-on-one intensive coaching. Um, and have you worked with small business owners as well in that experience? Absolutely. I'm doing it right now with an intensive program called Wisdom. Okay. And I say it all the time. O.S. Smith wrote this. We're drowning in information and starving for wisdom. Okay. And then somebody said to me the other day, wisdom tells knowledge what to do. Yeah, wisdom is that higher learning. You know, at the end of the day, it, it's really what I've done, the impact that I've had. And I'm big on service. Service for me is, is the highest calling. Um, so in my intensive program, it is. And I um, mean, we're crying, we're, we're journaling, we're figuring this thing out called life together. But ultimately, the commitment is to be a better version of yourself and, mm-hmm. and to be able to help people discover their wisdom based upon my example. And that's really the art, not to tell them what to do, but to inspire them to figure out what they should do on their own. Mm-hmm. That's how they discover wisdom for themselves. Mm-hmm. You know, the ego says, do it my way, do it my way and you'll be successful. But really, like Michael J. Fox said, which I thought was just so amazing, if a student doesn't learn the way you teach, then teach the way they learn. So to be able to tailor what I do to the individual and help them discover their unlimited potential, yeah, that's the cool stuff, Dana. It's it's just cool. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, so you do this kind of coaching in a six-month cycle, you told me. Mm -hmm. Um, And then, um, so with your school, um, we talked a little bit in the pre-chat about um, you did a little bit of teaching online and you got kids and, and also coached some teachers on how to teach martial arts online during the pandemic. But uh, now you're working uh, brick and mortar only or how, how has that kind of shifted? Well, yeah, I mean, the majority are back in person because I, you know, they call it in the tech sector IRL in real life. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, I, I call it being human, right? Well, why don't I have to use an acronym for being human? So yeah, people crave that, right? People crave that, but it's a balance. We just finished outdoors in San Francisco as of May 1st, who were still teaching outdoor classes. So we still have a certain amount of people virtually. Most of the people are back in person and, and we love it. I mean, when the pandemic hit, we went from a thousand students down to 700 overnight overnight, but we pivoted hard into virtual. And I did, I led the way because I like to be an early adopter. I love to boldly go where nobody's gone before. I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid. Failure is part of success. So Mm -hmm. cameras, angles, things like, you know, looking at your bookshelf, what's what's Dana reading there? Can I pick something that I can connect Mm -hmm. with you on? Mm -hmm. The first thing I said to my team was how amazing, and everybody all over the world, because I did maybe 20 different virtual events all over the world. And I said, when have we ever been allowed into people's homes Mm -hmm. 
You're in their home. Wow, how intimate is that? How humbling is that to be allowed that? So to not use that, but to leverage that in, in a very connective way with people has been probably one of the reasons why people have stayed with us virtually for what, two years? We still have people strictly virtual to this day. I just had two kids flying from Seattle that were in-person students, moved to Seattle during the pandemic, went virtual and flew down here to do their black belt test. I think that's that's the brave new world, right? That's a first in my life, you know, sure. doing martial arts for 50 years. I went, oh, well, but see, it's really about the purpose, live your best life. So it doesn't matter. If you have to do it virtual, we'll make it happen. Mm -hmm. We'll make it happen. If it's in a parking lot, we'll make it happen. And that's just yeah. having that grateful mindset. You know, when life gives you lemons, you make lemonades. And it doesn't happen to me. It happens for me. And it happens for me, not to me. And if I can recognize that, there's always a lesson to be learned. And there's a way to grow through it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you mentioned a lot about how um, you're working with Meta. And they've been asking you to um, do more training in leveraging leadership post-pandemic mm -hmm. and, you know, finding that balance with, um, you know, using a lot of tech in training still, but also, um, you know, getting into people's homes, like you said, and finding that connection, um, not only with the martial arts, but with uh, training leaders as well. So. Um, yeah, absolutely. Dana. I mean, if you think about it, we have, a, we have three different demographics that work for us. We have people that just work from home. Mm -hmm. We have people that are hybrid doing a little of both. And then we have people that love in person. What is the one thing that's going to connect all three of them? Your purpose. And ours is live your best life. See, and, and, and if, if you, anything that I've researched on, because I love doing research to back up my hypotheses, mm -hmm. is that any company that lives from purpose has survived wars, has survived the dot-com bust, 9-11, the recession, the mortgage crisis. A company that's purpose purpose driven doesn't do this when things go wrong they do this and they pull closer together and they really anchor themselves in the purpose and that's what we did that's what we did and we became closer better people through it and and that's powerful and and as far as the leadership goes i remember that one night you know it was in april when everything was completely shut down i left the school it looked like a movie studio we got 11 stations we're all doing virtual i come home and was and i looked at my wife i said babe, you're not worried about any of this? And she looked at me and she just gave me that kind of smile. She goes, no, nah, you got this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I, I am. If I had to think of all the time I've been in the trenches throughout my life, I'm built for stress. I'm built for this. Mm -hmm. And so it, it never wavered. I embraced it like a best friend. And that's the big thing. We live in a culture where suffering is shunned upon, right? That's why drug addiction is so high. I don't want to feel my healing, my feelings. Let's get drunk. Let's do drugs. Let's go spend a lot of money. Let's spend all our time at social media. Validate me, like me, comment, please. Somebody feed me, feed me. And when that's really not the answer, I don't believe. I believe the true journey is inward. And when you can be okay with you without somebody liking or comment or approving, when you can do that, not from ego, which is a dangerous animal. I mean, from a deep sense of humility, mm -hmm. right? From a deep sense of humility. That's when you can go out there and embrace your suffering for what it is. Because we will all suffer. You know, if you read my book, I've had my sister die. My mom's died. I've had two brothers die. I was bankrupt at 25. I mean, I've seen a lot of suffering. So I'm extremely grateful. I would never walk around like I'm a victim and the world owes me anything. I simply don't. I choose not to. Yeah. Yeah. And I think you also take a lot of your experiences into the character development system uh, that you've designed, uh, creating kids love life skills. So yeah. talk about this and how it's uh, in place. You said it's in place in about 400 martial arts schools, but also you're hoping to get it in place in elementary schools as well. Yeah, right now it's in meta. I mean, I took these life skills to Meta the other day and they were like, wow, this is cool. I think the big thing, what I do, which really helps parents feel more at ease is that none of our kids are born with focus. None of them are born with confidence or self-discipline or tolerance or empathy. They're born, none of them are. But guess what? It can be taught to them and through practice, it can become a habit. We were all capable of developing a new skill set, as one would say. I'm not just talking about a technical skill set. I think the life skill of integrity to always do the right thing, it is technical because every day you negotiate, right? Eat the chocolate chip cookie or eat the apple, 
Okay, well, I should eat the apple. It's healthier for me, right? So every day we have that opportunity to develop a new habit. And one of the great books I read not too long ago was Atomic Habits. Great book. And it talks about that, how any habit that's a bad habit can be replaced with a new one. And there is a process to that. So life skills are the same way. If you don't have focus, we teach a four-year-old kid, focus means pay attention. Look with your eyes, listen with your ears, think with your mind, do the right thing with your body. So are you looking? Great. Are you listening? Great. Are you thinking about what I'm saying? And are, is your body in the right position? And if all four engaged, then the quality of life is just so much better. So much better. And that's really important. If I'm eating ice cream on a hot summer day, I want to taste every bit of it. If I'm having this conversation with you, this is all that matters right now to me. Because once this is done, it's a memory. So if I'm really going to get everything I need from this or give Mm -hmm. everything I need, I need to be with you 150% right now. That's all that can exist. Oh, what am I going to eat for dinner later? Hey, after this, I've got a... I'm, I'm, life is a series of missed opportunities. So focus is one of those life skills I practice constantly. And it's just my checklist. Okay. You know, before I turned on, okay. I'm, am I looking great? I'm, make sure I'm my active listening. I'm engaged, right? Some people listen to give you a really cool answer. I listen to hear what you're saying. And whatever comes out of my mouth, my wife says sometimes you need more filters. <laughs> but I am, I just... That, that's the magic. That's the magic. I'm with you. So whatever comes out of my mouth is not scripted, is not pre-planned. Sure, it's 60 years of life experience and wisdom organically coming up through my memories, but this is where I need to be. And then, of course, think about what Dana's saying to me. Okay, what is she asking me right now? Oh, let me think of a cool answer. No way. I'm just, and then I'm leaning in and I'm actively listening. So I hear what you're saying. And the reply is, to what you're saying versus what I think would be a cool answer. And I think that's in a way how I serve better and how a simple life skill like focus can really make this so much more meaningful, so much more meaningful. Yeah. And I think of how educators, we often ask the kids to actively listen. However, when the teachers are doing you know, staff meetings, professional development, they're the worst students and they're not getting in their cell phone, you know, and all that. But that's, I will tell you when I did meta, everybody started with their computers open because it's natural. Two minutes in no cell phones, no computers. Nobody had to police them. Nobody had to tell them what to do. That was very cool. That was super cool. You know, but the thing is we live in this culture where, you know, like the Dalai Lama said, you do not need a smartphone to teach you you're smart. You do not need a Fitbit to teach you you're fit. You're missing out on the greatest gift you've been given, which is yourself. Get in tune with yourself and celebrate that. You know, celebrate who you are through being the best version of yourself. And if you can do that, instead, all these distractions, all they're doing is distracting you from yourself. They really are. They really are. And to be able to sit still and be quiet and just be okay with me if I'm sitting on a rock doing nothing, that's hard to do for many people. It is. It is. But for me, that's that's really part of what I share with people, whether it's a life skill, whether it's at Meta, whether it's at Stanford Healthcare, whether it's my events, whether it's just talking to a guy on the street. It's Mm -hmm. it's really about saying, hey, you're special. You're cool. Did you know that? Oh, no, I'm not comfortable with compliments. Well, that's okay. Mm -hmm. The best compliment you can pay is to yourself. Give yourself one, right? And it starts there, but it's not egotistical. Because when somebody says to you, you're so full of yourself, why? Yes, I am. You're so self-centered. Yes, absolutely. Mm-hmm. See, we think it's a bad thing, but if I'm self and I'm centered, then I'm balanced. I'll make better choices. I'll take the right actions and I'll see things clearly. If I'm full of myself, then I come to any relationship, any situation complete. Mm-hmm. Complete. And it's from that fullness you can give more freely. Anytime that I'm needy and greedy and I'm unbalanced, it's what's in it for me. What do I get out of this? What can I take from this? How can I get over? And that's what I grew up with in an impoverished environment. That's what I grew up with. And it's just, it's survivalistic. It's not living. And I think we are here to live. We really are. But do you have the courage to do that? Dying's not an option. That's the given. You're going to die one day. But living, that's a choice. 
And I think kind of tying back into that um, character building in children, uh, we're seeing a lot of teachers leave now at the end of the school year. And, you know, teachers are so often reactive to student behavior. So, you know, they say, I just can't stay in education anymore because I just can't manage these kids. So tell me a little bit how through your life skills program, you get the kids to focus and, um, you know, have them learn respect. Yeah, you know, I see that even with my 10 and 13 year old, there's really amazing teachers and there's teachers that are just done, right? They're just done. Maybe they need to change their career. A classic example of today's educator, what I've witnessed, and it's not to say all of them, please, is that if I want you to focus, I will say, look at me, pay attention when I'm talking to you. That's fear-based. Nobody's inspired by that. Mm -hmm. But what we do in a classroom environment, I'll look at, oh, Look at little Susie. I love how you're looking at me, ma'am. That's awesome. I focus. Boom. Suddenly everybody's looking at you because kids love attention. So do you, you know, adults, they love attention, but they can't differentiate between positive attention and negative attention. That's why anybody in showbiz will say bad press, good press doesn't matter. It's all good press to me, right? As long as they're getting attention. Well, I don't want people to gravitate to me for negative attention. I want to impact the world. So promoting positive attention is important. So when a kid does spin or traditionally not behaving, mm -hmm. sometimes you pay it no mind. You just let them be. And you highlight and spotlight the kid who is paying attention. And then they recognize, oh, paying attention is a good thing because everybody wants validation, right? Why is it that somebody posts, today's my anniversary at social media? Because they want everybody to like it and go, happy anniversary. They want validation. Well, that's human. Everybody wants to be validated. Everybody wants a kind word. Everybody wants to be acknowledged. Everybody. But how can we do that in a healthy way? And as far as educators go, we're in a very unique position to do that. But if you're tired and you're stressed and you feel underpaid and you feel devalued, then of course, that's challenging. That's challenging. I mean, the meme 30 years ago, you know, a kid gets a bad grade. Right. And the parents going like this to the kid, shaking his finger. 30 years later, the parents going like this, shaking the finger at, at the educator. That's a classic example. That's a classic example. So I believe like anything, it starts at home. If parents parent and step up, it's a different day. My wife is the PTA president. She stands in the white zone. We give heavy to the communities and back to the elementary school. And we just help facilitate a school dance. Sunday, we'll bring our cotton candy machine to the elementary school fair, right? Don't complain about the system unless you're in there doing something to make a difference. You think because you live in an affluent neighborhood and pay property tax, that gives you the right, you know, to complain to the teachers about the education your kid's getting? Uh-uh. Your property tax pays for part of that education. The rest of it is up to you. It really is. It really is. And so I think out of the guilt, parents often feel because they're not fully engaged in their children's life. They want to conveniently pass the buck, right? Because if I have one finger pointed at you, I have three pointed back at me, Dana. And am I willing to own those three fingers? That's very humbling. That's very humbling to own it. It is, especially if you're a CEO of a tech company or something like that. My daughter don't care. When she heard I was speaking at Facebook, she looked at my wife and said, Facebook has buildings. It's a real place. She thought Facebook's just everywhere. And, you know, I, she said something the other day and I made the stupid remark. Do you realize that I just spoke at Meta today? And she looks at me like, I don't care. I'm freaking 10 and you're my dad. I don't even know what that means. So kids are kids humble me every day. And I love that. I love that about working with a four year old or a five year old, which I do you know, on a daily basis sometimes. And I think it's the yin to the yang, you know, parents forgot they were once kids and we have to be willing to be that kid. You know, we have yeah. to be. <laughs> yeah, kid's just doing four. You're all, all upset at your kid. He's just doing four. That's what four-year-olds do, right? Uh -huh, uh -huh. That's what they do. And that's, yeah. that's something I have to remind my husband of sometimes with my six-year-old, right? It's yeah, they're just doing six. Six-year-old behavior, yeah. yeah they're just, but is it okay? right? Because I do believe in the yin to the yang. If a kid is not coachable, they're not employable. Mm -hmm. So at what point do they value the structure of a classroom? Do they respect the teacher? You know, because it has to be mutual respect, right? The yin and the yang. So I, I don't think it's an exact science, but I do. I, I commend every teacher because what they do is so hard, especially through this pandemic and everything. It's just so hard. And I think teachers should be paid a lot better and, and they should be offered the support 
you know, what do you do? You see it all the time. Teachers are frustrated fighting with some high schooler. Well, the yin to the yang, you got some big kid coming in and beating up teachers and the teachers are helpless and there's no support. And so it, it is, it's very unbalanced right now in many ways. So teachers are looking for lifelines and I think there needs to be more. Mental health too for teachers. There should be that type of counseling for them as well. There's so many things. I mean, we could talk about that one forever, but I praise anybody that's in the education system that still loves what they do and they're positive and they're still trying to impact and make a difference. And that's why purpose is so important, Dana, because even on the worst of days, I love what I do. Even on the worst of days, I love what I do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Talk to me a little bit about uh, the children's book that you are uh, wanting to write, uh, you told me to preach out you're waiting on funding, but uh, what is this going to be? Uh, kind of yeah, a well, I, one of the books are out and it's okay. available. I think it just sold out at Amazon again. So, okay. there, but it's called The Adventures of Bray and Tay. And we wrote the first book, Focus. And the artist was okay, but I'm trying to woo this other artist who's got a book deal right now. And it's about focus and it immortalizes my kids at three and six. And in the book, they go on a path discovering focus and how it impacts their everyday life and what that all looks like. Mm -hmm. So it's really cool. I mean, but we took out computers and everything. They're outdoors a lot. They're in the yeah. elements and that's intentional. And then I want to write one on confidence and discipline and, and, and all the rest, all the rest, all the different great life skills that help us be the best versions of ourselves, or as I say, to help you live your best life. Right? So the first book has been out for a while, but I wanted to do it in hardcover. And we couldn't afford that at the time. Okay. And it wasn't logical. And I want to do, you know, logically, the way a major book company is going to pick you up is you need to have three or four of those pretty much storyboarded and ready to go. Mm -hmm. So I want to work with this really cool artist because it's a children's book and it needs pictures. Pictures and words go together. That's why it's, you know, the cat in the hat. Mm -hmm. I, right. It's simple copy, but the pictures with the copies make it so compelling. So we do have one book that's been out for a while called The Adventures of Bray and Tay, Focus. And it's available at Amazon and on Kindle as well. So we are, we're trying to push that. And, and I'd love to get a book deal for that. Um, mm -hmm. Just, there's a lot more work. You can't go to bat, you know, unless you're ready to hit the ball. And mm -hmm. it's just the other elements aren't there. But the first one's out, we did that. So it's there and people enjoy it. Make sure I put a link in the show notes to that. Um, uh, talk to me a little bit about the morning routine and ritual that you have it, and some of the things you might uh, suggest that educators do as part of their morning routine. Well, for me, that morning routine Dana, is so important. Tony Robbins talks about it a lot. We want to put ourselves in a state, right? In a state, getting in that state to be optimal. When I wake up in the morning, the first thing I do is meditate. Well, first thing I do is breathe in. I am breathing, breathe out. I am grateful I've been given another day. And then I go through my gratitude list. I go through my prayers. I journal. After I journal, you know, I get up. I do the bathroom the same way. I wash my face. I brush my teeth. I go out. I turn on the coffee machine. I have a really nice espresso machine. And I make a latte for my wife. And I make a latte for me. Good organic coffee, you know, organic oat milk. And I make sure every morning, five days a week, when my kids are sitting there for breakfast, I sit with them. And, and I'm present with them because it's, it helps me become mindful of one of my biggest purposes in life, which is my family, right? So I just sit there with them and both get a kiss and no one leaves the house without it. Everyone gets a kiss in the morning at the end of the night. And that's important. Those searching rituals that have stood the test of time from culture to culture, every culture has rituals and those rituals are being forgotten because it's much convenient and easier to be distracted by looking at my cell phone or well, my iPad or the latest app or YouTube or TikTok or whatever the case may be. So the yin to the yang of that morning ritual is to put yourself into a state. So for an educator, I think like, because I am an educator, I just understand it's my purpose. And some people are going to get it. Some people are not, but it never going to stop me from trying. Never, mm -hmm. never, 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 never. Because if I can impact somebody's life and inspire them to be the best versions of themselves and put them on a path of self-discovery, and once they get momentum and they're out of the gate, people figure it out. They really do. They really, really do. And people don't like to be told what to do, nor should we tell them what to do. Because it's not my life. That's, a, that's why it's not live Brandon's best life. It's live your best life. But can I inspire you enough to have courage to do that? Through my example, 
I think so, right? And so I think for an educator, it's the same thing. You've got to ground yourself and walk in there and don't take it personal. If that kid wants to sit on his cell phone the whole class, then let him. Because I'm not going to get into a fight with you. I'm not going to embarrass you in front of anybody. And I darn well, I'm not going to take it personally and think it's you doing it to me. That's your choice. Will I write you up and alert your parent? Absolutely. Because that's protocol, whatever the protocol is, that I will do. Or I'll pull you aside later, as I really believe in private reprimand, public praise. You know, I'll pull you aside for your class and say, sir, you know, or ma'am, you know, I, I really want to help you learn. And, and I can't be a good teacher unless you're a good student. And if you choose to sit on your phone, I'm not going to tell you to get off. But if I can inspire you to make a better choice, you know, and give me a chance, you might learn something. And that sense of humility is better than do what you're told. I'm going to call your parents. Or you get an F. Get out of my class, you know. But it takes a lot of patience and the grind of doing it day in and day out as an educator. I get that. I'm an educator. I work kids as young as three and a half, clear up to executives at Meta. I get it. I do it every day. And a lot of days I have to eat crow and just take it, just take it from people. And that's okay. Cause it's not about me. I got, it's not about me. And they're simply, yeah, they're lashing out because they're afraid they're lashing out for, because they have post-traumatic stress syndrome from the, it doesn't make it okay. But if I can turn everything to some type of learning, at least, you know, when I go home and lick my wounds at the end of the day, I'm less beat up, you know? Yeah. yeah. And as an educator, that's just part of the course. That's part of the course. And I see it all the time. Kids beating up teachers in classrooms, teachers in full on fist fights with kids, right? Just it's way out there. It's way out there. It's way out there because control is an illusion. We don't have control. We welcome people into a space. And if they don't want to learn, then, you know, that's your choice. I can simply, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink, right? As the saying goes. But how do you create harmony in a classroom so you can still impact and affect the ones who do want to learn? See, so then I would go to the, the school and say, what are the systems of checks and balances here? After I've exhausted every positive, loving, human, compassionate, empathetic way with this student, what are the systems? What is policy, right? And then you utilize them. But those would always be my last choice. Yeah, and that's all about being non-reactionary and being proactive instead. So. Yeah, and that's why I mean proactive means pre-framing, right? Before you go in yourself, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, physically, it's all of that going in, right? But I get it. You know, in many ways, we're all so unbalanced because of this pandemic and all of this distractions so that's why you're looking go what's happening i just saw a woman went to jail she was having relationships with like four different of her high school students she's in jail for like 36 years i'm like how does that happen how do you go from being somebody in your 20s wanting to be an educator to that what happens along the way you know where that disconnect where you have so such low self-worth that you make choices like that right and it's not a judgment call i scratch my head because i wish i could help Right. So there's if there was some type of counseling in place where they could go, you know what, I'm having some not healthy thoughts here. Kim, can I take some time off? Right. Before I head down that that road. And we witness it every day. You see it in the Boy Scouts, you see it everywhere. What happens? Because I always start with this, Dana. They were once a little innocent baby. What happens? How do we become so broken that that we go down that path? And I was broken too. Right. But it was everything from Oh, three years of celibacy and not dating, beating drums in the woods with guys, sitting there staring at a Zen wall, anything. Because I just did not want to get off. I wanted off that hamster wheel. I wanted to be a better vision myself. And I didn't want to end up married three, four times like my father, right? My father was an extreme womanizer. And I was too for many years. And it was unhealthy. It was not me being the best version of me. And now I'm I'm blessed. I've been married 15 years. I finally figured that out, you know, but it was not easy. It was a hard path. It was a hard road to hope. I mean, if I had to say that, I can remember one of one story in the trenches when I was going through that. I remember it was like one in the morning. I'm laying face down on my living room floor alone, just crying, mourning that five-year-old boy that was in a foster home, you know, because I had to be strong enough as an adult to go back in and say, hey, little Brandon, I'm here. No one's gonna hurt you now. 
take my hand. Let's walk into the new day. You're a full grown adult. Stop acting like a boy. You don't need to do that and repeat that cycle of being a victim again and again and again. Right. So it is. It's not easy, but well worth it. Well worth it in the end. That's so inspiring to see how you, you know, turn that pain into something that you can grow from, you know, have yourself kind of center yourself when you get those thoughts. Um, so out of everything we talked about today on the podcast, what's one thing you'd like listeners to remember? That there's only one you in this world. And I don't say that with a sense of ego. That's a huge responsibility. Mm -hmm. The special gift that you are, there's only one of you in this whole world. Wow. So why be small? Why fall in line like sheep being led to slaughter? Why being like everybody else to be part of the status quo? Mm -hmm. Right? So, you, so everybody says, you're okay because you dress like me, you talk like me, you act like me. It takes great courage to be you. But to be you with respect, to be you with empathy, right? That's the art for me. I can walk around with bravado. I can walk around and be this bigger than life character, just stepping on people and being, you know, insensitive to everybody. Or I can honor myself and realize that I am a gift to me and to this world and do everything I can to be that, right? Not for validation, not for likes or anything. I mean, to do it because it's, it really feels good. Mm -hmm. It really does when the day's done, but it takes a lot of courage. It does. Yeah. Where can people connect with you and find you online? Absolutely. Of course, my podcast, Success Never Sleeps, and Mindful Meditations. It's at all the major podcast platforms. The meditation one is so cool. I encourage people to listen to them and download them as needed. You can follow me at Instagram, subscribe to my YouTube channel. As I said, my book, Live, Learn, and Grow, is available at Amazon and Kindle, um, and Audible, because it's also, I narrated the book as well. The Adventures of Brain Tay is there. Uh, follow me at Instagram, Facebook, and of course, at BrandonBeliso.com. Great. Well, thank you so much for being oh, my guest you. on the Out of the Trenches podcast today. Thank you.